in Europe where they only use LEDs. It's not cheap, but on long term, it is cost effective. They had, they considered they can afford to think about other values as well, not just the light at the football matches. So let me summarize what we have seen. At the beginning, the needs for converting the night into daylight have met the opportunity of electrical illumination. This solution has reached a maturity level which has been accepted by the official parties as well. And nowadays, we discover that we can take care of other values as well without losing the old values, the light. So we can think about the nature, consume less energy. We can think about our future. And I think this is what we have to do in testing. And similar paradigm shifts take place within testing as well. Of course, at different time scale. So at the beginning, we have some needs and opportunities, some shy attempt to address code quality and product quality issues. We get to a high quality mindset, which is supported by a professional continuous integration system. And nowadays we feel we can do more. We can think about other values as well. Because we testers shouldn't only take care of the product quality, but also of the product code quality. And this is what I'm going to present you shortly. So that's the agenda for today. My name is Istvan Nagy, um, and I am coming from Evosoft Hungary, where I'm playing the test architect role. I have seen the other sides of the barricades as an architect, so don't be surprised that I will invest a lot in the product code as well, because I consider that we might save a lot of work on testing side if we do it well on the product code side. So that's why I'm trying to strengthen the test automation domain nowadays at Evosoft. So let's start. It, it looks like history that eight years ago, some guys discovered that we can bypass the check-in policies at the company. And you know, usually not the guys breaking the rules suffer, but somebody else. So that's why some guys have developed the first application which was able to see whether the code submitted compiles, whether it has been reviewed by somebody else, whether the test succeeded or it respected some code quality rules. And shortly, the other teams came to us and asked for similar support so that we could run gated check-ins, which means run all the impacted tests of those changes. And if these have been proven green, we could start the regression tests, so all of my, uh, our important tests. And of course, we run in a night build all of our tests, including the non-functional tests as well. But we felt that soon this room won't be able to accept more machines. And why? Just because our code is quite big. This is one component of the entire framework and it is not called by mistake foundations. As you can see, it has almost half a million lines of code. What do you think about the test code? Is our test code associated to this component at the same size as the product itself? Who thinks testing is equal to product code? Who thinks that we have more test code than production code? More than half. The reality is that we have three million lines of code connected to this component. I'm not saying it's good. Maybe we are wasting our energy. But important is that you, testers here, take care of a bigger amount of code base than the developers. And if you are working agile, you take care of both. Not just the size of the code might be a problem, but the code dynamics as well. 
So statistics say that every two years, the size of the products on the market doubles. So lines of code, depending on time, doubles. That means exponential curve. And what about your employees? Do you double your number of employees every two years? Of course not, unless you are a startup company. So let's assume that you still hire some people, they are getting experience and they are using better and better tools. So their, the resources you have increase over the time, but that's linear. And the point here, the critical point here is where these two curves cross each other. Over this time, your resources cannot handle this amount of code. So you are dead after that moment. You have seen my agenda, so you already know the answer, how to handle this problem. So go back to the one box solution and try to make it more scalable. Either by virtualization or by using cloud, it doesn't matter. Important is that you can make it scale. You invest less in updating them, less in cloning them. Of course, you pay something for licenses, but it's scalable. And how does this look on the graph before? So you invest into tooling earlier, so you can increase the angle of that line. And you can shift the cross point to the moment T2. So you will survive longer. Do you see any other chance to shift this deadline even later? We increased the green curve. What if we decrease the other one? We die later. So what if we write less code? Simply write less code. That means write less test code. You don't need so much maintenance. It doesn't mean you write less features, but you can write them smartly. And you can save some time for yourself. In, uh, invest in yourself. Learn something, do research, enlarge your horizon, or just think about other opportunities. We want to write less code. But is this activity the most important during our daily life? So an architect goes to work, meets the product owner, and the product owner tells him, hey, I need this and this feature. He goes to the code, he reads it, analyzes it, and after that starts discussing with his colleagues, with the product owner. They guess how to start the implementation. Maybe you do test-driven development. So you start writing first the tests. So you type some code, you don't like it, you read it, you don't like it, you refactor it. Maybe you do pair programming. So one is just typing, the other one is reading the code. Then comes the review. Everybody is reading. You submit it into the integration, and what happens? it will fail in the integration, so you need to debug. Read line by line. And not to mention the fact that you might have new colleagues who will read your code for a long time before making the first changes. And this applies also to you when taking over some legacy code. And that's why statistics say that we spend much more time on reading code than writing it. So the question arises immediately, why don't we write readable code? Write less, write it readable, and you can save some time again for yourself. Our only chance when the code is big, I mean big relative to your resources, and if the code is getting bigger quite fast, so your only chance to survive is to control its size. Write readable code, easy to say. But is there any support which might tell us, hey guys, 
that's the good way you are improving continuously. Or it warns you whether you are going on the right, on the wrong, wrong track. And the answer is there are a lot of possibilities. We discussed today about metrics. Important is we choose the right ones and we understand their meaning. I'm gonna show you what we monitor usually. Let's understand what this graph is. So every method looks like this one. You have some input parameters, you do some decisions based on the input data, you do some actions, and you generate an output for, or you simply modify the environment. And what happens if this sequence becomes five meters long? Honestly, I would forget at the end what my original intention was. So monitoring the lines of code has sense. And we had this problem especially in the test, not in the product code. So, and nowadays it's, it's not possible anymore to submit large methods. You cannot check them in. I also mentioned these decision points within the method. The more decision points you have, in this graph, the harder it is to find the exact execution path of that method. So reducing the complexity makes your code more readable. I mentioned here cyclomatic complexity because this is that metric which is directly connected to the test. You need to write as many tests as the cyclomatic complexity of a method is. That means if you write simpler code, you need to write less code. So we can save time for ourselves. Static code analysis about, is about discovering those anti-patterns which have been proven in the past as leading to errors, to memory consumption, to concurrent resource usage, to deadlocks, anything. And if you can find those patterns within your code, you don't need to test them because you won't have it in the end code. You can save testing, you can save production code. Class coupling, you will think about that. I wanna say that the more dependencies I have, the more impacts I will face in the future. But I'm thinking about how much I need to read when I, I'm using some other classes. I need to know the features, I need to know how to use it correctly. And of course your main target. You like to write tests because you feel responsible for your code, so you incre increase the coverage. And this is only functional coverage. But have you ever thought about line coverage as a sign of a good design? Did you ever give a positive feedback to your developer colleagues that, hey guy, I reached this coverage and this is because you wrote a good code? And sometimes we have the false safety net, feeling of safety net, when writing more and more code for complex, writing more tests for complex code. And this is where crap comes into the picture change, risk analysis, and prediction. It says that over a well-defined complexity, you cannot help in anymore with tests. You should invest in the production code. So you should not write any test for crap code. Save that time for yourself. This is a dashboard of another component from us. Of course, I cut the names. So I will start with the lines of code column, which is not important as we saw today. But we can see we have the chance to write code, so we are proud of generating some functionality. We are allowed to write code. But at the same time, we break some coding rules. Here we just see the numbers. The next column says how critical those rules are. So rules compli compliance indicator is hi quite high, so we are breaking minor uh, coding rules. And of course, duplicate lines you will have always. The problem is that we have more duplicate lines in the test code. 
but we can handle that. Important is we know we have this technical depth. And of course, we have a quite good coverage, which is also increasing. Let me ask you a question. Let's suppose your project is running smoothly, but you foresee that moment when your resources will end up, and you have such toolings in your hands. Would you go to your colleagues, your management, and tell them, hey guys, I see this risk. Please take care of these or that, those numbers, and please prevent, prepare with corrective actions. Would you go to them and present such a logical argumentation? The parallel universe, thanks. So let's suppose you are the tester and you go to the, your developer colleague and say, hey, your, your code is crap. I, I mean, the crap index of your code is too high. So please rewrite your production code and I will start writing code, test code for that. What, how will they react on? Kill you? Yeah, that's true. So, the reality is that in our case, this kind of rational argumentation didn't work. Talking rationally to rational people didn't work. And what helped? I have a movie for you. It's called The Battle of Barbs, where two neighbors are fighting for the best decorated house of the street at Christmas. Have you seen that movie? Important is that uh, guys, please give me the movie. Thanks. Anything one is doing, the other one does something bigger. One is decorating the house, the other one decorates everything around. Even the wives give it up. We'll be in your second place this time. We are playing for best decorated house on the street. We are playing for the best decorated house of the street. Have you seen anything rational here? No? Were they motivated? Of course, their emotions were obvious. And this is the lesson I want to share with you. Fortunately, I have emotionally more intelligent colleagues at Evosoft. They told me I shouldn't address the rationality of the people. I should take care of their emotions, their reputation, their ego. And we didn't tell all these things to them, but simply went to one team and told them one metric one single metric which worked well in the other team. And this did this for all the teams. And when the first round was over, they started to work on topics they thought at the beginning as being nonsense. So we counted on their competition, and this helped. What I would like you to take with you to this stadium of the future is that we have values. People don't want to change their mind because they are fighting to some values. They don't observe that the world around has changed. New values appeared and nobody told them that, hey guys, we have other values as well. And this is why it is hard to go to your colleagues and to your management and say, we need to change something. So simply express your values and try to support your colleagues. In the past, writing a lot of code, writing scientific code, which is hard to understand, those were the values. Nowadays, clean code is trendy. And learn, simply learn, adapt your strategy to your values introduce trainings or just use tools which help them. 
I'm sure every one of you has a, work, a kind of continuous integration. That you monitor something and you know what you monitor and you know how to react on them. So feel free to use new tools. And if I would stop here, it would be what Kirkpatrick said. Define your goals, adapt your strategy, choose your tools and go ahead. But we need our colleagues as well. They need to be involved in these changes. And if you don't know their language, feel free to ask somebody from management, from people management, because intelligence and emotions are both important in order to have a good change management. They will change their mind if they agree with your goals. And they will change their mind if you, they can save some time for le learning new things, if they can think about the future. So let's test for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much.